Begin a 30-day free trial at audible.com and experience our unmatched selection of audiobooks and original audio entertainment, including ad-free premium podcasts like Where Should We Begin with Esther Perel. Listen in as the foremost authority on modern love, Esther Perel, meets with real couples and their stories become your stories. Join Audible today and receive a free audiobook on us. It's like something out of a, a movie. I mean, you, you, you're going to think that this is possible, but sure, why not? And all of a sudden, you have this local swindler with a massive distribution network. One of the ways he was able to perpetrate this, he was able to almost convince himself that what he was doing was real. I used to tell Frank, Frank, you're the COO. You're the chief obfuscation officer. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> he must have collapsed since the body. Where are you at? Oh, I can't get him out. I can't get him to move, and I don't know how long he's been in there. Ten months after Bernie Madoff's arrest, Barbara Pickauer, wife of Madoff's largest investor, Jeffrey Pickauer, Dialed 911. This call is hard to listen to. It's upsetting. Okay, stand the line. I'm going to start the medics to you. Don't hang up. Okay, I'm going to put your speaker so I can try to help take a bath. Okay. The fact that Jeffrey Pickow had a heart attack and drowned in his pool, you can congratulate me on that. According to Madoff, before Pickauer went for his final swim, Bernie phoned him. I called up Jeffrey Pickauer and, you know, I said, you, you got to give the money back. I said, you guys owe me money and I want the money back. Pickauer, you know, said, well, you know, I don't have it all. I, I said, Jeffrey, I know that you have the money there. You, you're worth $9 billion and I want $7 billion back. We'll get into the details of Madoff and Pickauer later in this episode. But for the moment, consider what Madoff's tone regarding the death of someone he knew for decades, what this says about Bernie Madoff, who he is. Whenever someone hears that I interviewed Madoff, they always want to know, does Bernie feel remorse? I've interviewed serial killers, child rapists, people considered monsters. I suspended judgment. I wanted to hear their stories, to understand them. This doesn't mean I wasn't horrified by what I heard, but I tried to see the world through their eyes and exercise in empathy. At times, I feel empathy for Bernie. But here's what struck me about Bernie. He didn't feel empathy. He claimed to feel remorse. He mouthed the words, but there was always a but. On the phone with me, every single time, Bernie mentions victims. He can barely get through the apology before interrupting himself. They were warned, they were greedy. Always this strange, sorry, not sorry. Yeah. I said, brokerage firms can fail. I could go crazy and do something stupid. <laughs> I said, it's, you know, if you want to guarantee, you know, put your money in government bonds. It's impossible to tell the story of the fall of the House of Madoff without understanding that there were real victims, real suffering. Back in early 2009, victims were telling stories of their ruined lives on TV, on the radio, on every local talk show. 
It was the worst thing that ever happened to us. This can't be real. We have lost everything. I have lost everything, and you've lost everything. Everything that we worked for is down the drain. I manage on food stamps. Sometimes at the end of the month, I scavenge in dumpsters. Now, of course, you listen to them. They're all they're living out of dumpsters, and they're uh, they you know they don't have any money, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure it's a it's a traumatic experience for some, but. You know, I made a lot of money for a lot of people. Did you catch the remorse? Or was it too fleeting to register in your brain? My producers and I were in touch with dozens of victims. To the victims, Bernie's indifference was enraging. All over again. But it wasn't the slightest bit surprising. What is surprising is what happened to victims since Madoff dragged their $65 billion down a dark hole. Once the media's white-hot spotlight drifted away, that's when our story really begins. And it's a strange story, one you probably haven't heard. To start, some victims are getting their investments back. I'm shooting fish in a barrel here. My guys have collected $11 billion. This is Amanda Remus, spokesperson for the Madoff Trustees Office. After the collapse, hardly anyone thought Madoff victims would get any money back. So far, they've gotten back $11 billion. Takes a bit of unpacking to tell this story. Let's rewind. After Madoff confessed to his family, his sons turn him into the FBI, and he's arrested. To get technical for a minute, the Madoff trustee's office gets its authority from SIPIC. SIPIC is the federally authorized institution that appointed Irving Picard and David Sheehan of the law firm Baker Hostetler as trustee and chief counsel, respectively, to unwind Madoff's affairs in bankruptcy court, recover money, return it to victims. In the movie version, the trustee's office is the cleanup crew, the people assigned to mop up the mess. But to be clear, they're lawyers. The problem for the cleanup crew is this, where to get the money to give back to the victims who lost everything. Only one place. You have to take it from the people who have it, the people who took out more than they put in. Which brings us back to Jeffrey Pickauer, the guy who drowned, and his widow, Barbara. The U.S. attorney held a press conference. Barbara Pickauer has agreed to forfeit to the United States a little over $7.2 billion, a figure that represents every last dollar of the Pickauer's profit from Madoff's epic fraud. One of the great charades of all time was the press conference that Barbara decided to give back $7 billion because that was what Jeffrey would have wanted Anybody that knew Jeffrey Pickow almost died laughing thinking of that. Pickow was one of the big four, the major investors who made billions through Madoff. Now Madoff claims that with one phone call, he induced a heart attack and forced the return of $7.2 billion to his hurting clients. The cleanup crew laughs that off. They didn't need Madoff's help. They filed a lawsuit against Pickauer's estate. The U.S. attorney joined the fight, and his widow settled. The captain of the cleanup crew, David Sheehan, had this to say about Barbara Pickauer. Look, all I know is this, and I'll say this in her behalf, uh, is that she did the right thing. She claimed that she had no knowledge of this whatsoever. We told her it was, uh, you know, seven billion in fictitious profits, and she gave it all back. Recovering these fictitious profits allows the cleanup crew to return victims' money. As of January 2016, over 1,300 accounts have gotten their entire investment returned. That means thousands of people have gotten all the money they gave to Madoff returned. Pickhour settlement was the largest single recovery, but it is only one piece of the story. The cleanup crew filed a 1,000 lawsuits against people who took out more money than they put in, like this guy. What's your favorite yoga position? Well, the crow, where I would um, balance on my hands. He's a fitness instructor, spends a lot of time on his yoga mat. Let's call him Matt. Back in 1991, Matt landed a job trading for Madoff's legitimate business. Matt was not your typical Wall Street suit. When I was... There at Madoff, he had this big office up in the newer trading floor. 
And to take breaks, I would go in his office. I mean, Bernie was hardly ever there. And, and literally, yeah, sometimes I would stand on my head for a while and do something else to, to de-stress. You know, then I would go back and trade. And I felt that actually helped me. It would um, relieve, I could then think more clearly, you know, and, and trade better. He worked as a trader and was good at it. And then... I think it was, it was 1995, around 1996. He started hearing rumors around the office. So I'd always heard you know, it was kind of secondhand that he had this investment in business below and that he, he was doing a great job and it was very profitable. And that I, I thought it was a very small, little tight business that he wasn't accepting many clients, only kind of special situations. He got up the nerve to knock on the boss's door. And so I actually approached him and I said, you know, is there any way that I could, um, you know, invest in your, in, in, in your business? And he kind of made it seem like he would think about it and, and eventually came back to me again, almost like he was doing me a favor. It was like, like a kind uncle or something, you know, letting me get in on something good kind of thing, you know. I felt like it was a reward to be allowed to invest with him. So, so I was happy about it. The one thing he told me was that, you know, not to talk about it because he didn't want other people to get jealous. He said he didn't let many traders invest with him, but since I'm, you know, I've been doing so well and helping, you know, making a lot of money for his firm, he would do me a favor and allow me to invest with him. And I didn't want to blow it, so I, I certainly kept it to myself. He had arrived. Things were fantastic. It was a great living. I was very happy. I really enjoyed it for a while. After a while, he burnt out. I remember walking into Andy Madoff's office and Andy and Mark talked with me. And again, they were stunned. They said, well, they kept saying to me, well, how are you going to make this kind of money anywhere else? I said, well, I don't care. I don't need to make money anymore. And, you know, I'm fine. And they, they would look at me like puzzled, like no one had ever done that. Like, they, they couldn't fathom. More money didn't motivate Matt. I didn't need a fancy car or, you know, eat caviar, and that's not me. Trading and making money in Wall Street was always a means to an end. And for me, the free time and the freedom is worth a lot more than the material things. And, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money to get put on shorts and uh, go and no shirt and go play volleyball on the beach. So so it was, it was, it was a great life for a while. It was doing what I loved doing. Wow. Um, there's the American dream. Yeah, it was. 36 years old, living in the South, teaching fitness and yoga. <laughs> but I guess it was, it was too good. <laughs> Until two, uh, 2008, certainly, um, <laughs> the American dream ended for me in that regard. 12 years after investing in Madoff, Matt hears the news. You know, that two and a half million or so that I thought I had my nest egg is gone. So how does Matt respond? So my thoughts were I try to be optimistic. All right, well, it'll be all right. I, you know, got back home and then told my wife, and she was totally supportive. and. She was like, you know, we'll be fine. You know, I'll find something to do to work more and so forth. So I certainly, the good thing is I had my family support right away. And I got over that. I got over the loss fairly quickly. And I figured, hey, I'm going to be fine. Not, not the end of the world. The lesson learned. This is what I picture. The yoga instructor assuming his favorite yoga position, the crow, walks around on his hands, de-stresses. Uh, you know, I, I kind of got over to some degree, losing the money and accepting my fate, because that was done and over. Then one day in December 2010, he gets a letter from the cleanup crew. I was opening the mail up in my office in my room, and I was just, I was just stunned. I got a demand letter uh, asking me to pay back money. That was the shock. Clawback, that's what it's called. The cleanup crew wanted a million dollars from Matt. You know, I knew, obviously I knew I was innocent. They must have known I was innocent since I had all that money in the account, which obviously was lost and gone. Again, the fact that I lost the money and a bad investment on I can get over that. But to have a dark cloud hanging over you that you can't settle for so many years, that's what really got me depressed. For me, the clawback is worse than actually losing, uh, than the loss to Madoff. The, the money, the, the money I had it made off, I had, it was in there, right? It was there, it was tangible. The money they're asking me to pay now, I don't have anywhere. You know, it's one thing if, if someone had some knowledge and was helping Bernie perpetrate the crime or doing something, but I never thought that in the United States of America that you could, that an innocent investor would be forced to put back money if they were innocent. You know, that was just, that was just the, the I thought the unfairness of it and that's, and that, that made me really depressed and really upset. Want to know what makes me really depressed and really upset? Some of them, in some instances, perhaps they were um, 
lying to shareholders about how Madoff made money. Some of them, you know, overseas. Did you say lying? Lying. There's much more coming up after the break. Stick around. You know, it's one thing if, if someone had some knowledge and was helping Bernie perpetrate the crime or doing something. But I never thought that in the United States of America that you could, that an innocent investor would be forced to put back money if they were innocent. You know, that was just, that was just the, the I thought the unfairness of it. And that's, and that, that made me really depressed and really upset. But think about it from the cleanup crew's point of view. It doesn't matter if Matt didn't know anything about the fraud. They never said he did. The clawback is about returning money to people who lost money. It is fair, brutally fair. Those thousand legal complaints were filed against people who received more from Madoff's company than they put in. The complaints are the truth. Money went from the company out to people, and it, that money that went from the company out to people that we can show that that money went to them belongs to other people. That's it. The cleanup crew's job? Spread the pain, equitably. Take from one, give to another. Like Madoff, only in reverse. Attorney David Sheehan has been on the cleanup job since day one. He gets it. Uh, you know, along the way, we are inflicting pain on people. And we know that. We're cognizant of that. And I'm talking about people who didn't know, but got somebody else's money. And now we're asking for it back. And that, that's painful for them. I'm more than likely they've spent it. You know, most people don't take money out of Madoff and put it in a bank. They took it out and paid for college or bought a home or did the normal things people do with their investments. So to ask them for the money back is indeed inflicting pain. That, you know, you're never really, I'm never happy about that. And I don't mean to be cavalier about it either. I, there's nothing but pain being inflicted there. But on the other hand, we have no real choice. The cleanup crew's barrage of lawsuits has upset the lives of folks like Matt and brought in big settlements like pick hours. But when it comes to victims, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Matt gave his money directly to his boss, Bernie. But there were billions of dollars and many thousands of investors who came in through feeder funds. I'm Manuel Gallego. It's December 23rd, 2016. Manuel lives in Chile. He spoke to a reporter working for us, Martina Castro. She's translating his words. The first person in my family to arrive in Chile got here in 1939, after the Spanish Civil War. And that's when the development of the fishing industry began in Chile. His family made a bunch of money as fishermen. And that's how it developed, first through my grandfather, then my father, and later us. Our main focus was the fishing industry, and later we branched out into the forestry and real estate sectors. Fast forward a few decades, Manuel's family is looking to invest several hundred thousand dollars, not in anything risky, something safe. They bank with Banco Santander, a private Spanish bank with prestige in Latin America. Manuel met with an account executive. An executive showed us some products, she gave us performance charts, she gave us some data and indexes of risk that we're familiar with. They always gave you some return, but not much. You know, like using U.S. Treasury bonds as a safe haven, for example. But these had better returns. He was reassured by the saleswoman. According to Manuel, she told him, Oh, we're Banco Santander, we're the biggest in Europe, we have branches all over the world, we're regulated by the SEC in the United States. We're a safe bet. His family invested. Around 2006, we bought these instruments. That is to say, we bought Optimal. Optimal was a fund set up by Banco Santander. It fed money from people like Manuel to Madoff. But you never imagine that a bank is going to offer you something fraudulent. 2008, Madoff implodes. Manuel calls the account executive, hoping his money is safe. I called her on the phone and I asked her, what's the extent of my portfolio's exposure with respect to the scam? And she told me she'd send me something in the afternoon. Click. I 
And later she says, look, you have two instruments valued between $350,000 and $400,000, which are involved in this scam. And at that exact moment, the bank didn't know what it was going to do. He kept talking to the bank, even made a trip to New York to try to come to a resolution. But he was dissatisfied with what they were telling him. Here's what happened. When I saw that the bank wasn't going to give me an answer, I went on the internet and started looking around. Manuel wasn't alone, not by a long shot. Banco Santander's optimal fund had funneled $3 billion to Madoff. There were thousands of investors. People were freaking out. You had all these people in chats of affected parties in Spain and Latin America. And I found a couple of websites of American lawyers. I remember there were two, and I chose the law firm Labaton. They had a certain reputation in New York, so I spoke to them. And hired them. At Labaton, Manuel's lawyer was Argentine-born fraud attorney Javier Blakemore. I went with my producer, Kelly Prime, to talk to Javier in his office in Midtown Manhattan. At no time throughout this whole process, anybody did the right thing. Fine, Bernie Madoff is perhaps the most despicable human being, you know, in the financial industry ever. You could argue that. But at the end of the day, when they sold and represented that they thought Bernie Madoff and his investment was stable and safe, that's just unacceptable. 70% of Optimal's cash came from Latin America. Many of the investors weren't like Manuel. They didn't have hundreds of thousands to invest. They had, you know, saved $50,000 after 20 years of working in Argentina. And here came Banco Santander and, and offered them, you know, what was supposed to be a safe investment. It was a big Spanish bank with great reputation. And so they, they, bought, they bought the pitch. As soon as Madoff collapsed, Javier's phone started ringing day and night with investors from Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, all through Latin America. He remembers one call in particular. It was a, a young woman, probably in her 20s, and she said, you know, can you talk to my mother? Because she is very distraught and doesn't, and I understand that you speak Spanish. And I said, yeah, sure, well, what, did, you know, what is the nature of your investment? And she said, well, it's about $15,000. And so I felt like it was a little bit of, we're sitting around the kitchen table because the discussion was very basic. The discussion was basically that money has disappeared. You may be able to bring a lawsuit, but the lawsuit is expensive. It's certainly gonna cost more than $15,000, so your best alternative is probably a class action. And all these, even discussions at that level, were, you could tell that it was very hard for them to understand. You know, they had never thought of a legal action, let alone, okay, so what is a class action? And how does that work? And how did it come to be that Santander gave this money to what had become apparent was one individual, Bernie Madoff, and $3 billion, and they said, okay, so there was $3 billion and Santander lost it all. They couldn't comprehend it. It's kind of heartbreaking. It was. It really, you know, um, it was. It, some of the conversations were very painful because there was also only so much I could do. Javier put together a class action suit against Optimal, but it got tossed out. We got dismissed on a technicality and got sent to Switzerland. But Switzerland doesn't have any class action procedures. And so by sending it to a jurisdiction where there is no class actions, the lawsuit effectively died. Even though Optimal fed money to a U.S. money manager, Bernie Madoff, Technically, it's not based in the United States. Think about what this meant for the woman with $15,000 in Optimal. She's out of luck. It'll cost more than she invested in the first place to go chase it in Switzerland. We'll get deep into the details in the next episode. Banco Santander did settle with most of its customers and with the trustee. Just like Manuel is only one of many thousand victims, Optimal is only one of many funds. Which brings us back to the cleanup crew, whose job it is to get money for the victims. Cleanup crew spokesperson Amanda brought another one of their attorneys to our recording studio. I, I'm going to tweet that I just gave you a Mountain Dew because you know okay. that's like... Uh...
a diet Mountain Dew. I'm on a, I'm on this diet. I can't let people think that I'm not. Uh, oh, should should I put on my headphones? Right Attorney there. Orin Warshawski described for me what he saw as they were combing through Madoff's records. During the years that followed Madoff's implosion, they started seeing documents where, at the time of investment, before investment, during investment, diligence people were spotting some of the issues we were. Diligence people, the people at savvy financial institutions whose job is to make sure that nothing shady is going on with customer money. And they were seeing some shady things. Some of them, in some instances, perhaps they were um, lying to shareholders about how Madoff made money. Some of them, you know, overseas. Did you say lying? Lying. Lying. Oren and the cleanup crew attorneys spent months debating what to do about what they were seeing. Could they find a way to use this information to get more money back for the victims? But at the end of the week, we would sit down and talk through what the heck was going on. And so we would sit in a room and, you know, again, it was a small group and we would sit down and, uh, of course, we joke around. We always had like a little lunch, you know, brought in for us. Thing, you know, nothing fancy. What, what's your diet? Uh, what's your diet sandwich? Uh, I wasn't on a diet at that point. It was uh, <laughs> so it had to be some veal parmesan, you know, with extra bacon or something. So, uh, um, but the, it's a small conference yeah, room round table. It's a small conference room with a square table. Um, you know, in particular, there was you know, I just remember one day when we all sat there. It was one of those kind of cold spring days where you, you can't quite warm up. It's uh, rainy outside, and it's a Friday, and uh, everybody's exhausted. We were all working around the clock. We were all there. You know, lots of times we'd share a car home with some of us at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 a.m. at night, uh, and see each other back 8 a.m. the next morning. Friday came. All we were thinking about was leaving, you know, early, and early could be like 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night. And uh, we were sitting around, and uh, and we were talking about it and saying, Is there a way to hold these folks accountable? These folks, the heavy hitters, the savvy financial institutions. What is it, you know, what can we do? What is there a way to do something or is this just not our claim? And if it's not our claim, how will the victims receive any money? All right, what is it, what is if if we really think, at that point we weren't sure, but if we really think, you know, pick a name, J.P. Morgan, HSBC, UBS, the companies that we sued for, uh, damages, if we really think that they were worse than the average customer or they really helped prolong this and deepen the insolvency here. Which you do believe. Uh, which, yeah, for, you know, depending, I, I don't want to, you know, take a position on any one of them in a vacuum, but y- the answer is yes, we believe that. Um, and we were saying, if we can satisfy ourselves, it's, it's pointing in that direction. We're seeing evidence that leads us in this direction. Uh, if we can get there, is there anything we can do for the customers? Is there anything we can do for the people who, you know, who, who lost all their money? If a court makes the banks, the funds pay damages, a lot more money could be funneled to the victims. And so the crew decided to sue the big financial institutions who in turn fought back and denied all allegations. Well, we sued, uh, again, some of them because we thought they, through their acts, they deepened the insolvency. They were crooked. And, um, well, that wasn't our burden at the time. We had to show that they were, that they lacked good faith. But you guys are the underdogs? I mean, given given the law and given what you're trying to do? Oh, uh, to say we're underdogs doesn't even do it justice. I don't think anybody even expected us to do it. I don't think... Uh, to do what? To, to bring these types of claims. Against the big institutions. Against the institutions or against these individuals. I don't think anybody expected us to do anything other than clawback claims. Uh, I don't think they expected us to really try and push the envelope for any, and to push for anything other than profits at that time. This is bold. No bankruptcy trustee had ever said, hey, big institution, you saw that something was wrong and decided to keep your profits rolling in rather than blow the whistle. And for that, we think you should have to pay. So this is your big legal hurdle you have to overcome. Yeah, it's a huge one. And we didn't overcome it. A judge put them in their place, basically said, who do you think you are? Your job is to clean up this mess. You do not get to pass judgment on who made the mess. But to be clear, 
Just like in Javier's class action suit, the judge never ruled on the merits, whether the financial institutions were complicit in Madoff's crimes. The defeats from these many legal battles may have dramatic implications. The most troubling to me might be. Extraterritoriality. In November 2016, the court ruled the trustee can't chase money outside of the United States. U.S. bankruptcy law only has power in the United States. And guess where most of the funds are registered? The cleanup crew spokesperson, Amanda Remus, bangs her fist against the table. It may end up being the rule that even though Bernie Madoff was in New York and his LLC was in New York and the money originated in New York, but if you can get it out to the Caymans and then send it over to the Bahamas, oh, for fuck's it's sake, not really? catchable. Mm. Do you see the problem there? The cleanup crew now finds themselves in a strange place. They've recovered a lot of money, more than anyone anticipated this time. But what will happen next time? They've lost ground through these battles, extraterritoriality, and another big setback. Now they can only claw back two years instead of six. And so if the crew had to do it again, they'd have less power. Would a settlement like the Pick Hours be as big under the new rules? Probably not. In the future, if these things happen again, it's like a, it's like a freak show. If this happens, and all you have to do is get it to the Caymans and we can all commit, like, this is crazy. There are some precedents being set up that have the potential of making crimes like this lucrative to people. Super hard to wow. recover. Lucrative to people like savvy financial professionals. When I'd started my journey through Madoff's universe, I'd focused on one star, Bernie. The master criminal who shook your hand, looked you in the eye, then con the shirt off your back. But here's the thing. Madoff hadn't acted alone. The funds, the banks, they sold him around the world. For them, Bernie was an opportunity. They took a commission and in return promised to safeguard your money. How did it go so wrong? That's where my journey has led. Bernie is doing 150 years. Who else should be held accountable? for this catastrophic explosion. Next time on Ponzi Supernova. Obviously, first of all, this conversation never took place. Nobody cares if anyone likes each other. It's, it's, it's finance. The financial community would like to think he's an outlier, that he was an aberration. That could never happen again. And none of that is true. Ponzi Supernova is an Audible Originals production, hosted by Steve Fishman and produced by Ellen Horn. Our production team is Kelly Prime and Todd Whitney, with help from Jane Cohen. Colin Campbell is our editor. Our score was created by Darren Gray, Mike Cruz, and Glenn Kochi. Our audio was mixed by Mike Cruz. For more information, go to ponzisupernova.com. This is Audible. <laughs>